Marley was dead, to begin with. The register of his burial was signed by Scrooge, and his name was good for anything he chose to put his hand to. Marley was as dead as a doornail. Scrooge was his sole executor, administrator, heir, friend, and sole mourner. And even Scrooge was not so dreadfully cut up by the sad event. But on the very day of the funeral... He was an excellent man of business and solemnised it with an undoubted bargain. Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name. There it stood for years afterwards above the warehouse door, Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes people new to their business called Scrooge Marley by mistake. But he answered to both names. It was all the same to him. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Hard and sharp as flint, secret, self-contained, and as solitary as an oyster. The cold within him froze his old features, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheek, stiffened his gait, and spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. <laughs> He carried around his own permanent low temperature with him, icing his office in the dog days of August and not thawing a single degree in December. One Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. It was cold, bleak, biting weather. The city clocks had only just struck three, but it was quite dark already. The fog came pouring in at every chink and keyhole and was so dense that the houses opposite were mere phantoms. Scrooge kept his door open so that he might keep an eye on his clerk who sat copying letters in a dismal little cell. Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerk's fire was so very much smaller that it looked like a single coal and he couldn't replenish it. The Scrooge kept the coal box in his own room. A Merry Christmas, Uncle. God save you. Bah, humbug. A Christmas, a humbug, Uncle. You don't mean that, I'm sure. I do. Merry Christmas. What right or reason do you have to be merry? You're poor enough. Come then. What right have you to be dismal and morose? You're rich enough. Bah, humbug. What else can I be when I live in such a world of fools as this? Out upon Merry Christmas. What's Christmas to you but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer? If I could work my will, every fool who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. Uncle. Nephew. Keep Christmas in your own way, and let me keep it in mine. Keep it? But you don't keep it. There are many things from which I might have derived good, but by which I have not profited. Christmas among them. I have always thought of this time in the long calendar year as the only one in which men and women seem, by one consent, to open their shut-up hearts freely, and think of people below them as if they really are fellow passengers to the grave and not another race of creatures on other journeys. And therefore, uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold in my pocket, I believe that it has done me good and will do me good. God bless it. From the confines of his cell, the clerk spontaneously applauded. But quickly sensible of his impropriety, he took to poking the fire and extinguished the last spark for ever. Let me hear another sound from you and you'll keep your Christmas... By losing your situation. Don't be angry, Uncle. Come dine with us tomorrow. (laughs) But why, Uncle? Why? Why did you get married? Because I fell in love. Because you fell in love. Good afternoon. We have never had any quarrel to which I have been a party, but I have made this trial in homage to the season, so I'll keep my Christmas to the last. So, 
A Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon. And a Merry Christmas to you too, Bob. Merry Christmas, sir. There's another fellow. My clerk with 15 shillings a week and a wife and a family talking about a Merry Christmas. Ha! In letting Scrooge's nephew out, the clerk had let two other people in. Portly gentlemen with books and papers to hand, they bowed to him. Scrooge and Marley's, I believe. Do I have the pleasure of addressing Mr Scrooge or Mr Marley? Mr Marley has been dead these seven years. Seven years ago tonight. At this festive season of the year, Mr Scrooge, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute. Many thousands are in want of common necessities because... Are there no prisons? Plenty of prisons. And the union workhouses are still in operation... The treadmill and the poor law are in full vigour, then? All very busy, sir. Oh! I was afraid, from what you said at first, that something had occurred to stop them in their useful course. I'm very glad to hear it. Under the impression that they scarcely furnish Christian cheer of mind or body, a few of us are endeavouring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink. What shall I put you down for? Nothing. You wish to be anonymous? I wish to be left alone. Since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen, that is my answer. I don't make merry at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support these establishments. They cost enough, and those who are badly off can go there. Many can't go there, and many would rather die. They had better do it then, and decrease the surplus population. <laughs> It's enough for a man to understand his own business and not to interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Seeing clearly that it would be useless to continue, the gentleman withdrew. Scrooge resumed his labours with a more facetious temper than was usual with him. <laughs> Decrease the population. <laughs> Meanwhile... The fog and darkness thickened, and the cold became intense, piercing, searching, biting. The owner of a scant young nose, gnawed by this hungry cold, stooped down at Scrooge's keyhole. God bless you, Mary, gentlemen, may nothing you dismay. <laughs> Scrooge seized a ruler and flung it, <clears throat> with such energy of action that the singer fled in terror. At length, the hour of shutting up the counting house arrived. You'll want all day off tomorrow, I suppose. If quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient and it's not fair. If I stopped you half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used, I'll be bound. And yet you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. It's only once a year, sir. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. But I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier in the morning. On his way home, the clerk went down a slide on Cornhill 20 times at the end of a lane of boys in honour of it being Christmas Eve and then ran home to Camden Town as hard as he could pelt to play at Blind Man's Buff. Scrooge took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern. Having read the newspapers and beguiled the rest of the evening studying his banker's book, he went home to bed. He lived in chambers that once belonged to his deceased partner, a gloomy set of rooms within a lowering pile of a building in which nobody else lived. The yard was so dark that even he, who knew every stone, had to grope with his hands until reaching the door. This night, he fumbled the key into the lock and saw in the knocker Marley's face. It was not angry or ferocious, but looked at Scrooge as Marley used to, with ghostly spectacles turned up on its forehead. And though the eyes were wide open, they were perfectly motionless. As Scrooge stared at this phenomenon, it was a knocker again. Huh? To say he was not startled would be untrue, but he did look cautiously behind the door as it opened, half expecting to be terrified by the sight of Marley's pigtail sticking out into the hall. 
but there was nothing on the back of the door but screws and nuts. Poo poo. Scrooge was also not a man to be frightened by echoes. He fastened the door, walked across the hall and up the stairs. But before he shut his heavy door, he walked through his rooms to see that all was right. Sitting room, bedroom, lumber room, all as they should be. Nobody under the table, nobody under the sofa, the bed, in the closet, in my dressing room. Small fire in the grate, spoon and bowl ready, saucepan off gruel on the hob. He double-locked the door, got dressed for bed and sat by the fire to eat his gruel. It was a very low fire indeed, and he was obliged to sit close to it. The fireplace was an old Dutch one, surrounded by tiles that were decorated with scenes from the scriptures. As he stared at them, he saw Marley's face again. As it appeared, one by one... In place of the Cains, Abels, Queens of Sheba, Abrahams and Belshazzars in each tile. Humbug, said Scrooge, as he walked across the room hurriedly and sat down again. Throwing his head back in the chair, his glance happened upon an old disused communication bell that hung in the room. He stared at this bell, and as he stared, it began to swing slowly, hypnotically. Of its own accord. <laughs> then, deep down from the cellar came a clanking noise, as if some person were dragging a heavy chain over the casks in a wine merchant's cellar. Up the stairs from the floors below it came. It's humbug still! I won't believe it! Jacob! The very same. Marley in his usual waistcoat, tights and boots. The chain he drew was clasped about his middle, long and wound about him like a tail. It was made of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers and deeds. His body was transparent so that looking through the waistcoat, Scrooge could see the two buttons on the back. He had often heard it said that Marley had no guts, but had never believed it till now. How now? What do you want with me? Much. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you? In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Ugh. You don't believe in me? I don't. Why do you doubt your senses? Because any little thing affects them. You may be an undigested piece of beef, a blot of mustard, a fragment of underdone potato... There's more of gravy than the grave about you, whatever you are. Humbug, I tell you, humbug! The ghost sat perfectly motionless, its hair, skirts and tassels agitated as if by the hot vapour of an oven. (laughs) Taking off the bandage from its head, Its lower jaw dropped onto its chest. (gasps) Mercy! Dreadful apparition! Why do you trouble me? Man of worldly mind, do you believe in me or not? I do. I must. But why do spirits walk the earth and why do you come to me? I am doomed to wander through the world and witness what I cannot share, but might have shared on Earth and turn to happiness. You are chained? Tell me why. I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link and yard by yard and wore it of my own free will. Is this pattern strange to you? Do you recognise the weight and length of the strong coil you bear yourself? Jacob. Old Jacob Marley, tell me more. Speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give. But you were always a good man of business, Jacob. Business? Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. 
charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence for all my business. The dealings of my trade. Who but a drop of water in the ocean of my business? <laughs> oh. <sighs> Hear me. My time is nearly gone. How it is that I appear before you in a shape that you can see, I may not tell. <laughs> I have sat invisible beside you many a day. That is no light part of my penance. I am here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate, Ebenezer. You were always a good friend to me. Thank you. You will be haunted by three spirits. Is that the chance and hope you mentioned, Jacob? It is. I, I think I'd rather not. Without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow when the bell tolls one. Couldn't I take them all at once and have done, Jacob? Expect the second on the next night at the same hour. The third on the following night. At the last stroke of twelve. <sighs> Look to see me no more. <sighs> Remember what has passed between us? <sighs> Scrooge followed Marley's ghost to the window, desperate in his curiosity. The air outside was filled with other spectres who were joined by Marley. <laughs> Hello, Ebenezer Scrooge, isn't he? No, no, let me help you. Whether these creatures faded into the mist or it enshrouded them, he could not tell. But they and their spirit voices diminished together, and the night became as it had been when he walked home. Scrooge examined the door through which the ghost had entered frantically. It was double locked, and the bolts were undisturbed. Suddenly, the world turned black. <laughs> When Scrooge awoke, it was so dark that, looking out of bed, he could scarcely distinguish the transparent window from the opaque walls of his chamber. When the chimes of a neighbouring church struck the four quarters, he listened for the hour. Why, it isn't possible I have slept through a whole day and far into another night. This should be twelve at noon. He scrambled out of bed and groped his way to a frost-covered window. All he could make out was that it was still very foggy, extremely cold and silent. Scrooge went to bed again and thought it over. Had it been a dream or not? Remembering that the ghost had warned him of a visitation, he resolved to lie awake until an hour passed. <laughs> the hour itself and nothing more. Scrooge found himself face to face with a strange figure. Like a child, yet also like an old woman, diminished to a child's proportions. White, aging hair surrounded a tender face that had not a wrinkle on it. And the hands and arms were long and muscular. It wore a tunic of the purest white, held a branch of fresh green holly, and carried a large cap under one arm. Strangest of all, a bright, clear jet of light sprung from the crown of its head. Under this light, the figure fluctuated in its distinctness, being now a thing with only one arm, then one leg, then twenty legs, now a head without a body, and then complete again. Are you the spirit whose coming was foretold? I am. Who and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No, your past. What brings you here? Your welfare. A night of unbroken rest might have been more conducive to that. Your reclamation, then. Take heed. 
Rise and walk with me. Though gentle, the ghost's grasp was not to be resisted as they floated towards the window. Uh, I am mortal and liable to fall. Bear but a touch of my hand on your heart and you shall be upheld in more than this. At these words, they passed through the wall and stood upon an open country road with fields on either side. The city had entirely vanished. It was a cold, clear winter day with snow on the ground. Good heavens! I was bred in this place. I was a boy here. Your lip is trembling. And what is that on your cheek? It is just a pimple. Lead me where you will. You recollect the way? Remember it? (laughs) I could walk it blindfold. Strange to have forgotten it for so many years. Let us go on. They walked along the road with Scrooge recognising every gate, post and tree until a little market town appeared in the distance. Shaggy ponies trotted towards them with boys on their backs, calling to and shouting at each other in great spirits. Billy Shields! Nathan Watts! Oh, John Jones! Scrooge knew and named every one of them. These are but shadows of the things that have been. They have no consciousness of us. The school is not quite deserted. A solitary child, neglected by his friends, is left there still. As the door opened before them, they saw a long, bare, melancholy room, made barer still by lines of plain benches and desks. At one of these, a lone boy was reading near a feeble fire. Scrooge sat down heavily on a bench. <laughs> The spirit touched him on the arm and pointed to his younger self, intent upon his reading. For just a few moments, Scrooge became again the boy he once was. There's the parrot! There he is! And poor Robinson Crusoe! One Christmas time, when yonder solitary child was left here all alone, they came to him just like this. I... He called out to Crusoe when he came home again after sailing round the island. Poor Robinson Crusoe, where have you been? (laughs) The man thought he was dreaming, but he wasn't. It was the parrot. (laughs) Poor boy. I wish... But it's too late now. What is the matter? Nothing. There was a boy singing a Christmas carol at my door last night. I should like to have given him something. That's all. Let us see another Christmas. The boy grew older and larger, and the room a little darker and more dirty. He was not reading now, but walking up and down despairingly. Dear, dear brother, I've come to bring you home. Home, little fan? Yes, home for good and all. Home for ever and ever. Father is so much kinder than he used to be that home's now like heaven. He sent me in a coach to bring you, and you're to be a man and are never to come back here. But first we are to be together all the Christmas long and have the merriest... Always a delicate creature, but she had a large heart. So she had. She died a woman and had, as I think, children. One child. True. Your nephew. Yes. They were now in the busy thoroughfares of the city at evening. Here too, by the dressing of the shops, it was Christmas time again. The ghost stopped at a certain warehouse door. Do you know this place? Know it. I was apprenticed here. They went in to be greeted immediately by the sight of an old, stout gentleman sat behind a desk that was so high that it almost knocked his head against the ceiling. <laughs> Why, it's old Fezziwig! Bless his heart, it's Fezziwig alive again! Yo-ho there, Ebenezer, Dick! Scrooge's former self, now a grown young man, came briskly in, accompanied by his fellow apprentice. Dick Wilkins, to be sure. Bless me, yes, there he is. He was very much attached to me, was Dick. Poor Dick. Dear, dear. Yo, ho, my boys. No more work tonight. Christmas Eve, Dick. Christmas, Ebenezer. Let's have the shutters up before a man can say... 
Jack Robinson. Every movable was packed off and the warehouse was made as snug, dry, warm and bright a ballroom as you would desire to see on a winter's night. In came a fiddler with a music book. In came Mrs Fezziwig, one vast, substantial smile. And the three Miss Fezziwigs, beaming and lovable, followed closely by the six young followers whose hearts they broke. In came all the young men and women employed in the business, some shyly, some boldly, gracefully, awkwardly, pushing and pulling in great humour. And then away they all went, dancing, twenty couples at once. There were forfeits, cake, a great cold roast, mince pies and plenty of beer. The party culminated in Mr Fezziwig standing out to dance with Mrs Fezziwig. A light appeared to issue so brightly from Mr. Fezziwick's calves that they shone in every part of the room like moons. When the clock struck eleven, this domestic ball broke up. The Fezziwigs on either side of the door shook hands and wished Merry Christmas with every person as they left. Goodbye. Merry Christmas. Goodbye. Merry Christmas. For the whole of this time, Scrooge had acted like a man out of his wits. Heart and soul were entirely in the scene with his former self. (laughs) A small matter to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. Small? He has spent but a few pounds of your mortal money. He has the power to render us happy or unhappy, make our service light or burdensome, a pleasure or a toil... Say that his power lies in words and looks, things so slight and insignificant that it is impossible to add and count them. The happiness he gives is quite as great as if it cost a fortune. What is the matter? I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now. That's all. My time grows short. Quick. Scrooge saw himself again. Now a man in the prime of his life, but beginning to wear the signs of care and avarice. He sat by a fair young girl in a black dress of mourning, eyes in tears. It matters little to you, very little. Another idol has displaced me to cheer and comfort you in times to come. What idol? A golden one. This is the even-handed dealing of the world. There is nothing on which it is so hard as poverty, and nothing it professes to condemn with such severity as the pursuit of wealth. You fear the world too much. All your other hopes have merged into one, to be beyond the chance of its sordid reproach. The master passion gain engrosses you. What then? Even if I have grown much wiser, I am not changed towards you, am I? Our contract is an old one. It was made when we were both poor and content to be so. You are changed. When it was made, you were another man. I was a boy. Your own feelings tell you that you are not what you were. I am. The happiness that was promised when we were one at heart is fraught with misery now that we are two. It is enough that I have thought this and can release you. Have I ever sought release? In words, no. In what then? In a changed nature an altered spirit in all that made my love of any value or worth in your sight. If this had never been between us, would you seek me out and try to win me now? A penniless girl? No. You think not? I release you, with a full heart for the love of him you once were. You may have pain in this, but after a very, very brief time, you will dismiss the recollection of it gladly as an unprofitable dream. May you be happy in the life you have chosen. Business, money, money, business. Spirit, show me no more. Conduct me home. Why do you delight in torturing me? One shadow more. No more. I don't wish to see it. Show me no more. But the relentless ghost pinned both his arms and forced him to observe what happened next. They were in a room, not very large, but full of comfort. Near to the winter fire sat a beautiful young girl, so similar to the one he had just seen, that it seemed it was her. But she was now a comely matron, and this likeness sitting opposite was her daughter, 
They were surrounded by what seemed a multitude of children, playing, tussling, fighting, giggling. The mother and daughter laughed heartily and joined in, just in time to greet the father, who arrived home laden with toys and presents. And now Scrooge looked on more attentively than ever when the father, his daughter leaning fondly on him, sat down with her and her mother at his own fireside. Bill, I saw an old friend of yours this afternoon. Who was it? Guess. How can I? I don't know. Mr Scrooge? Mr Scrooge it was. I passed his office window. As it was not shut up, I could scarcely help seeing him. His partner lies upon the point of death, I hear. And there he sat, alone. Spirit, remove me from this place! I told you they were shadows of the things that have been. That they are what they are. Do not blame me. Remove me! I cannot bear it! Leave me! Scrooge turned upon the ghost, wrestling with it. But to no avail... Seeing that its light was burning high and bright, he seized the ghost's cap and quickly forced it down on its head, squeezing with all his might. Scrooge's painful journey has begun. In next week's final part of A Christmas Carol... Enter, Ebenezer Scrooge! The bell struck twelve. The ghost was gone. Scrooge remembered Marley's prediction. Lifting up his eyes, he saw a solemn, draped and hooded figure coming rapidly like a mist on the ground towards him. No, I don't know much about it. I only know he's dead. And now undo my bundle, Joe. What do you call this? Bed curtains? You don't mean to say you took them down rings and all with him lying there? Why, bless my soul. Who is that? It is your uncle, Scrooge. I have come to dinner. Will you let me in, Fred? 